A very good morning to all of you. I warmly welcome everyone for today's CPD program. For today's CPD program, organized by Government Medical Officers Association and Society for Health Research and Innovation. The webinar link will be open to you today from uh, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. 10 a.m. And the no late attendees will be entertained thereafter. Each, Each attendee should attend to the end of the, the webinar to obtain the e-certificate for participation. The link for applying part the e-certificate will be sent to the chat box at the end of the webinar. You will be given CPD points which are strictly adhered to NCCPD guidelines. They will be discussed at the end of the session. Also, we kindly ask you to mute your microphone and switch off the video to avoid any interruption during the session. So now let me introduce today's speaker, Dr. Bandara Ekanayaka, consultant in emergency medicine at National Hospital of Sri Lanka. Among many academic qualifications, he's a leading character in research area uh, with publishing more than 50 publications in national and international peer-reviewed journals and conferences, and also as the research co-chairperson in Sri Lankan College of Emergency Medicine. Also, Dr. Bandara is instructor for emergency life care and advanced life support in Sri Lanka. So today's session will be on diabetic emergencies, evaluation and management. Now, it is over to you, sir. Good morning, uh, all of you. Uh, thank you, uh, Sachini, for very kind words of interaction. Uh, first of all, I must thank GMO and Sri for organizing this kind of a uh, interesting lectures. Uh, without any delay, uh, I'm going to start my talks. Uh, today I'm going to talk about diabetic emergencies. Topic is evaluation and management. Okay, shall we start with some cases and then we'll go through these cases. Okay, my first case is 65 year old male who is known patient with diabetic and on insulin coming with the reduced level of consciousness to em your emergency department. And uh, his known patient recently diagnosed patient with meningioma and awaiting neurosurgical intervention. The relatives brought patient to the emergency department. And when we assess ABCD, his airway is patent and the self-maintaining. Uh, breathing, there was no problem we detected. Circulation, pulse rate was 74 and blood pressure was 130 by 70. His GCS was 13, uh, 11, and his CBS was, blood sugar was 2 millimoles per liter, and his temperature was normal. How do you manage this patient? That is my first question. Since this patient who is known patient with meningioma is a very recent diagnosis and awaiting neurosurgery, the relatives may uh, mainly worried about he had an advanced disease, basically the meningioma. But when you go through simple ABCD, we found that patient had a significant hypoglycemia. Why hypoglycemia is very important? It mainly cause is a fatal disease. And repeated mild episode, which may lead to accumulative brain damage, that is why it is so important to know about the management of hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is confirmed by the Whipple triad, which is presence of symptomatic hypoglycemia and the low blood sugar level, basically the serum blood sugar level and resolution of symptoms with glucose. The signs of sign and symptoms of hypoglycemia varies depending on the level of uh, glucose in your body. And there are, they can be categorized into mainly two, which are, first one is symp sympathetic, which are tachycardia, sweating, anxiety, pallor, and tremor. But when you get the more hypoglycemic symptoms, patient develop neuroglycopenia, that is confusion, slurring of speech, focal neurological deficits, uh, fits and coma. And the precipitant for these hypoglycemic events 
are mainly drugs, for example, insulin and the long acting antidiabetic drugs such as sulfonylurea. And exercise, inadequate carbohydrate intake, and errors of insulin dosage and the ethanol intake, which are the main precipitant for hypoglycemia. This patient, uh, we can categorize a oh, patient who is having hypoglycemia into mild, moderate, severe, but it is important to know about moderate and severe hypoglycemia mainly, because mild only they can self-treat. Moderate hypoglycemia is defined as a blood sugar of 40 to 70 milligram per deciliter or 2.2 to 3.9 millimoles per liter. And severe hypoglycemia is defined as a less than 40 milligrams per deciliter or less than 2.2 millimoles per liter. This patient, we go through a ABCD approach. And after that, I'm going to mainly concentrate on how to manage hypoglycemia per se. Hypoglycemia is basically, as I mentioned, is defined as a hypoglyce, uh, mainly defined as a blood sugar levels less than four millimoles per liter. And then we want to see whether the patient able to treat himself or herself. If it is not, then we need to think about the patient, whether the patient is having any uh, intravenous access or not. If patient doesn't have any intravenous access, then you need to give IM one milligram of glucagon. Why glucagon is important? It mobilizes glucose from resources and it causes, uh, uh, it, it improves the glucose level in the blood. And if patient does not have any, uh, if patient does have any intravenous access, we can give 10% dextrose. This is total dose of 200 milliliter. You can give 50 milliliter of aliquot until up to 200 milliliter. But please don't give 50% dextrose in a patient who is hypoglycemic, even though he is in a cardiac arrest. And you need to check the repeat blood sugar in 15 minutes time. And if blood sugar is still low, you can give another 200 milliliter of 10% dextrose. And again, you need to check sugar level in 15 minutes time. If it's still it is low, then you need to continuously give 10% dextrose, usually 100 ml per hour infusion, and you need to regularly monitor the blood sugar. But this volume, basically depending on the patient's volume status and comorbidities. If patient does show an improvement in the blood sugar level that is more than four millimoles per liter, then this, and if patient is able, unable to swallow, then still there is a place for giving intravenous glucose. But if patient show, patient able to swallow and blood sugar level more than four millimoles, then we encourage the patient to take long acting carbohydrate, 20 gram orally. That is usually two slices of bread and two biscuits. But if you have given IM glucagon, then the carbohydrate level should be double and as because it need to mobilize glucose. On the other hand, if hypoglycemic patient able to self-treat. The main goal of treatment is oral and oral rapid acting, carbo rapid acting carbohydrate is encouraged. These are oral glucose gel, two to four teaspoons of sugar or dextrose tablet. We, unfortunately, we don't have, but you can try with glucose gel or two to four teaspoons of sugar. And you need to check the sugar level in 15 minutes time again. If patient show improvement is blood sugar level that is more than four millimoles and patient is able to swallow, then you can give long acting carbohydrate that is 20 grams. Or if patient does not show any improvement in the sugar level, then you need to give dextrose infusion, as I mentioned, 100 ml of 100 ml per hour of 10% dextrose. 
and if patient is able to uh, uh, if patient is taking oral uh, glucose rapid glucose and after 15 minutes if patient does not show improvement is sugar then you need to repeat oral glucose or you can straight away go ahead with the intravenous 200 milliliter of dextrose that you can give 50 milliliter aliquots the uh, i'm going to speak again uh, the special circumstances in hypoglycemia which are mainly the alcohol if patient is taking chronic alcohol or if patient is chronically malnourished you need to give iv thiamine one to two gram of one to two gram per kilogram prior to giving or at the time of giving glucose because it need we need to give thiamine to prevent when in case encephalopathy and next one is if patient is uh, glucagon is not and patient is not uh, not suitable for glucagon if patient is taking sulfonylurea drugs and patient who is having a liver failure and patient who is having a chronic alcoholism because little uh, uh, little uh, little glucagon uh, available for mobilization little glucose basically and the hypoglycemia secondary to the long acting insulin or sulfonylurea a continual infusion of 10 percent of 100 ml per hour should be given because it has a prolonged effect on a prolonged effect and causing repeated hypoglycemia Therefore, we need to give 10% glucose in 10, 100 ml per hour infusion. Suppose you don't have a 10% glucose available in your department or where you're working. Then how do you make 10% glucose out of which you available, like 5% dextrose? You can add 10 ml of 50% glucose solution to 100 ml of 5% glucose solution that you can create 110 ml of 10% glucose or simply you can remove 50 ml of 500 uh, 50 ml from 500 the sachet of 5% dextrose and you can add 50 ml of 50% glucose then you can get 500 ml of glucose which is strength of 9.5% almost 10 percent and then you can use this for either for boluses or as an infusion why we can't give 50 percent dextrose for a patient who is having a hypoglycemia there are mainly three concepts concepts are involved in first and most uh, the important thing is rebound hypoglycemia because once you give 50 percent dextrose you the patient will get excess of glucose you, you get strom of glucose and it increases uptake and the utilization by tissue in addition it suppress the gluconeogenesis as well as glycogenolysis therefore patient will get rebound hypoglycemia and the second thing is this 50 percent dextrose is hypertonic solution it has a 2500 milliosmoles per liter which is very irritant to uh, vein and if it is extravasated it can cause necrosis in addition it can cause in, in induced thrombopropitis and other thing is overshooting hyperglycemia can also occur if you're given 50 percent dextrose therefore we encourage everybody to give 10 percent dextrose rather than 50 percent dextrose for a patient who is having a hypoglycemia. If you come across patient who is having a hypoglycemia per se, and he doesn't have any other injuries or any other illness, then you can, be dis you can discharge patient from the, your emergency department or your uh, uh, emergency room. The criteria for discharge are episode is brief. If patient is having a brief episode and patient get full neurological state and if patient is able to eat patient does not show any major comorbidities and cause for hypoglycemia you have identified for example patient has taken excess of insulin or patient does not take adequate meal 
and patient know how to prevent if patient got another attack. That is awareness. And this is basically an accidental or relapses is unlikely. For example, if patient is taking long acting insulin or patient is taking the long acting oral agent, then patient might develop another episode of hypoglycemia. In that case, patient need to be admitted. But if patient is taking the short acting drugs or short acting insulin, then we can discharge the patient. In addition, if patient can monitor glucose at home or in nearby station, or responsible adult should be accompanied and follow-up can be arranged. These all, if these all criteria are fulfilled, then we can discharge patients safely from emergency department or emergency room. A uh, little, a uh, few words about uh, uh, hypoglycemia in pediatrics. Uh, in patient who is coming in the pediatric patient who is coming in the hypoglycemia, you can treat with two ml per kg, 10% dextrose. Or if patient does not have a cannula, you can give IM glucagon. A usual dose of glucagon is if patient is having that less than 25 kg, that is half oil, that is 0 0.5 milligram or unit. Or if patient is more than 25 kilos, then you can give one milligram or one unit of glucagon. Pearls and pitfalls of hypoglycemia management. First, patient who are taking, uh, who have taken uh, an insulin or sulfonylurea overdose are at risk of hypokalemia. Therefore, we need to encourage if patient is had this uh, uh, medication, you need to need continuous monitoring of ECG as well as you need to identify whether the patient is developing hypokalemic changes as well as you need to check in the blood. Second one is treatment option for hypoglycemia depending on the cause and level of consciousness. Glucagon IM is suitable for patient with hypoglycemia due to insulin excess, but not sulfonylurea overdose. Patient who are decreased awareness of hypoglycemia must advise to stop driving. And beta blockers can mask adrenergic response to hypoglycemia. Therefore, patient might develop straight away neuroglycopenic symptoms. And considering uh, giving a parenteral thymine at the time of a glucose administration in patient with thymine deficiency, for example, if patient is overstarved or patient is on chronic alcohol consumption, then you need to give it to prevent vernicate encopedopathy. Okay, shall we move into the second case? This is, you have handed over a patient of 30 year old male with known type 1 diabetes who has been feeling generally unwell with abdominal pain and vomiting. His vitals are, he was able to maintain in airway and breathing was normal with saturation of 96% on room air. Circulation wise, his pulse rate 125 beats per minute with blood pressure of 88 by 48. His capillary refill time is less than, more than three seconds. His GCS is 14, it's a bit confused. CBS show value of high and the E and a temperature was 37.37 centigrade. How do you manage this patient? Uh, since this, this is a critically ill patient and who shows hyperglycemia, anyway, patient need to be in the resuscitation room. In addition to that, we need to get blood gas analysis. In BBG, it shows pH of 7.05 with carbon dioxide of 2.5 and bicarbonate of 6.2. Patients show, show in metabolic acidosis with hyperglycemia. And his ketone body, basically the urine ketone body was three plus. Therefore, our working diagnosis of DK made 
before that, I'm going to define DKA. DKA is defined as a three main parameters, which are blood sugar level more than 11, or known patient with diabetes or normal sugar, even patient can develop DK. Second thing is ketonemia or ketonuria. If patient, if able to, if you're able to take ketonemia, then you can check with the ketone meter. If it is more than three millimoles per liter, that is significant. Or if you don't have a ketone meter or measure serum measurements are unavailable, we can check urine ketone bodies which if patient is having a more than two plus, that is positive for keto. And third one, if patient's bicarbonate level less than 15 or venous pH less than 7.3. If these all three criteria are met, we can define patient as a DK. And we can uh, uh, go ahead with the management. As we all know, for a patient who is coming with a critical, who is critically unwell, we need to look after patient in a resuscitation room and we need to assess patient in airway, breathing, circulation, disability and exposure wise. This patient, we give adequate oxygen for and ventilation we need to support. I'm not going to discuss about the oxygenation and the ventilation method here, but he is hypotensive. For hypertension, we need to give intravenous fluid resuscitation, but inotropes later, yes, uh, patient, if patient is having a septic shock or cardiogenic shock, later on we can think about, but first line treatment is IV crystalloid resuscitation. And the management of DK per se, there are a few concepts are available. First, first is IV fluid resuscitation. Second one is insulin administration. Third one is correction of electrolyte abnormalities. And fourth one is treatment of underlying cause and complication. For that, we need to have some bedside investigations. First, as we mentioned, we need to have a capillary blood sugar. But this capillary blood sugar level is sometimes uh, unreliable. For example, if patient is having a peripheral shutdown, especially patient who is in shock, this capillary blood sugar is unreliable. Therefore, in that case, we need to have a venous or arterial blood sugar level to be kept, uh, checked in the central laboratory, or you can check with the blood gas analysis. Second one is we need to have a blood gas, which is basically the VBG, Rather than ABG, we need to check pH, bicarbonate, and the potassium level. Third one is we need to have a urine uh, ketone bodies to be checked, either urine or serum. We are encouraging to have a serum ketone body. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, access to the serum ketone bodies in our settings. Therefore, we need to go ahead with the urine ketone bodies. Other one is ECG because patient who is having a DK or hyperosmolality, patient might develop or patient have a, a underlying myocardial infarction, which may be silent. Therefore, we need to have a continuous ECG monitoring as well as the 12 lead ECG. Uh, for the, I have the, uh, encouraged you to take a VBG rather than ABG because there's no any discrepancy if patient comparing the pH, bicarbonate level and the potassium level comparing the VBG and the ABG. And the pH level is just difference of 0 0.03. Therefore, we encourage you to take VBG because it is very quick and you can do it in a, a, a very quick manner. That is why we encourage you to take the VBG rather than going for ABG. Uh, ABG is uh, important if patient is having a significant hypo hypoxia. Uh, in that case, yes, we can go ahead with the ABG. In fluid resuscitation, patient who is having a typical DKA, having a water loss of 100 ml per kg. For example, if patient is 70 kg, he is having a fluid loss of 7 liters in his body. 
and the sodium loss is 7 to 10 millimoles and the potassium loss of 3 to 5. This IV rehydration need to be done with crystalloid, basically the normal saline. But you need to keep in caution because if patient is having kidney failure, renal failure, heart failure, or if patient is elderly or adolescent, basically the 18 to 25 years of age, you need to think about this rate and the volume of fluid replacement and which need to be modified according to the individual basis. This is uh, how we can give intravenous fluid. This can be categorized basically into two arms. First, if patient is having initial blood, uh, initial blood pressure, that is basically the systolic blood pressure, more than 90 or less than 90. If patient is having a blood pressure of less than 90 as our patient, we need to give 500 ml of uh, 0 0.9 saline, normal saline over 15 minutes. If patient got improved, that is systolic blood pressure more than 90, after you give in the in initial fluid bolus of 500 normal saline, you can go to the second, uh, the other arm. But if, we, if still patient does not show improvement is blood pressure, that basically systolic blood pressure, you need to repeat another bolus of same crystalloid or and or as well as you need to think about other causes of hypertension like sepsis heart failure the patient is still remaining hypotensive after two boluses of crystalloid then you need to pay, admit the patient into the critical care environment itu setting in that case you might need in uh, anthropic support but if patient improved or patient does show blood pressure of initial blood pressure of more than 90 systolic, then you can give one liter of normal saline, one liter of 0 0.9 saline over 60 minutes, that is one hour. After that, you need to include potassium chloride from the second bag, from second liter of fluid. And the, this fluid can be given on the basis of this one double two double four six uh, uh, basis. For a, uh, example, for a patient who is coming with blood pressure, uh, more than systolic blood pressure, more than 90, you can start with 1000 ml of normal saline over one hour. Then after that, in the next two hours, another one liter with KCL, another uh, two hours again, patient with same, same amount of normal saline with KCL. And in next four hours, and another four hours, and another six hours, this one liter of normal saline with KCL need to be infused. Insulin administration, we need to start insulin administration basically uh, after starting after starting intravenous fluid because we need to hydrate the patient adequately before you give in insulin. Aim of giving insulin is not to lower glucose level, but to clear up uh, uh, ketone, ketone bodies. We need to start fixed rate of intravenous insulin infusion, that is 0 .0 0 0.1 unit per kg. If patient normally uses exogenous insulin, that is for example, if patient taking long, long acting insulin, you need to continue this as normal. Once glucose drops to the level less than 14 millimoles, you need to add 10 ml of 10% of dextrose infusion at a rate of 125 milliliter alongside the normal, normal saline infusion. And you need to reduce the rate of intravenous insulin infusion to 0 0.05 unit per kilogram per hour when you when your sugar level comes down less than 14 millimoles per liter. In addition, the, uh, the potassium correction, before potassium correction, you need to think about whether the patient is having a good urine output, that is 0 0.5 ml per kg per hour. If patient, does, if patient is anuric or oliguric, or if patient show potassium level more than 5.5 millimoles per liter, we can't give potassium in this patient. 
if patient is more than 5.5, we can't give potassium. If patient is 3.5 to 5.5, you need to include 20 millimoles in 500 bag of normal saline, that is strength of 40 millimoles per liter. If patient is having a potassium level less than 3.5, you need to get a senior advice. Basically, you need to give potassium chloride before you start in insulin, because once you started in insulin infusion, the already hypokalemic environment get vigorous hypokalemia, patient might get arrhythmia and the cardiac arrest. Therefore, if patients show potassium level less than 3.5, you need to correct potassium level before you start in insulin. And patient need to be in the ITU setting. Uh, metabolic target for patient who is having the high uh, DKA, uh, we need to reduce ketone body concentration by 0.5 millimoles per liter per hour. And you need to get down bicarbonate by 3 millimoles per liter per hour. So you need to not get down, but you need to basically increase. You need to improve bicarbonate level by 3 millimoles per liter per hour. And you need to get down capillary blood sugar 3 millimoles per liter per hour. And you need to maintain potassium level between 4 and 5.5. If these targets are not achieved, you can increase fixed rate of insulin by one unit per hour. For example, if patient is 60 kilo, now patient is on six unit per hour. If patient does not show this metabolic target, does not show improvement in these targets, you need to increase fixed rate of insulin by one unit per hour. And you can check in next hour whether the patient is getting this upper target, metabolic target achieved. If it is achieved, then you can continue that fixed rate, fixed rate of insulin. Uh, for, uh, other, other thing is continue, you need to continue insulin infusion until ketone measurements are less than 0.6. Sometimes we might prematurely stop insulin infusion. Uh, for in that case, patient again will develop ketonemia. Therefore, please, when you have a patient who is having a DKA, your target uh, ketone level is 0 0.6. Or in urine, you can't detect ketone level. Therefore, and other targets are pH of 7.3 and the venous bicarbonate over 18. These called resolution of DKA. For a resolution of DKA, I'm repeating, patient need to be have a, a ketone level, ketone measurement less than 0 0.6, pH of 7.3 over, and bicarbonate level more than 18. In addition to that, we need to identify the causes, cause for DKA, maybe infection, maybe a compliance issue, maybe over exercise, we need to look after the, this course because otherwise if you are not address this course, you might develop, patient might develop DK again or patient might deteriorate. Therefore, please, when you have any patient who is having a critical ill, you need to think about cause, especially in patient uh, uh, who is having a severe ill. Bicarbonate, uh, whether we can give bicarbonate for a patient who is having a metabolic acidosis, Routinely, it is not encouraging because it has a significant drawbacks. For example, if you give sodium bicarbonate to patient who is having a metabolic acidosis and shock, a patient will develop intracellular acidosis, which worsens the situation. In addition, this given bicarbonate can cross blood brain, uh, can cross blood brain barrier and increase carbon dioxide level in the brain. That is also very nasty condition. Therefore, we are not encouraging to give bicarbonate at all. But if it is a real, real indicator, for example, if patient going into the cardiac arrest or if patients not responding to the treatment because of metabolic acidosis, in that case, you can try with bicarbonate, but not for a patient who is having a DKA per se. Uh, one few word about the antithrombotic treatment because patient who is having a DKA usually bed bound 
and he, they have a high osmotic component in his blood. Therefore, they might develop DVT or pulmonary embolism. Therefore, they encourage you to give low molecular weight heparin, basically the uh, prophylaxis dose. Uh, okay, then uh, we come across with the DK, and then once your DK is resolved, how the pa how patient can be converted to a is subcutaneous insulin dose. Subcutaneous regime when the DK is resolved and the patient is able to eat, that is the main prerequisite is for the starting of subcutaneous insulin. The continuous insulin infusion, uh, the you need to continue the in, con that insulin infusion at least 30 minutes, at least 30 minutes. Usually we encourage you to have at least one hour, but 30 to one hour at least before, uh, after you administering subcutaneous dose of insulin. And okay, if patient is, if you are going to start insulin infusion, then you need insulin subcutaneously. You need to continue insulin infusion at least another 30 minutes to one hour before you stop intravenous insulin. And restarting subcutaneous insulin in patient who has already on insulin. For example, suppose this is our patient who is coming with, who is had the diabetic, type 1 diabetic, and he is already on insulin. If that patient comes, we need to check whether his HbA1c is in an acceptable range. If patient is having an acceptable range of HbA1c, then you can continue same previous regime. No need to change the regime, but you can start with regime, but you can adjust the patient's insulin regime according to the patient blood sugar level. But remember that if patient who is having all who is on already subcutaneous insulin, you need to continue same insulin regime if patients show acceptable range of HbA1c. If patient is not on insulin, for example, this is the first presentation for uh, uh, first presentation of diabetes. Patient come in with the DK, that is the first presentation. In that patient, you need to estimate total daily dose of insulin that can be achieved by multiplying his body weight in by 0.5 or 0.75. 0 0.5, usually we take in 0 0.5. For example, if patient who is coming with DK, uh, DK, that is first presentation, who is 60 kg, the total daily dose of insulin is 30, 30 units. In 30 units, you can give uh, the rapid actin two third and the long actin one third. But if patient who is having a more resistance, for example, if patient is having a type two diabetes, then we need to increase this, uh, uh, the total daily dose of insulin. You need to get it done by multiplying his body weight by 0 0.75, because he need more insulin than patient who is otherwise normal. A few words about uh, uh, the definition and the pathophysiology again. Patient who is who will develop DK mainly type one diabetes, but patient who are type two, which are ketosis prone diabetes, these patient also will develop DK. Therefore, patient who is developing DK, not only the type one but also type two, they, they are called ketosis prone diabetes. As I mentioned before. I revised the DK definition, blood sugar more than 11 or non-patient with diabetes who is having a ketonemia of more than three or ketonuria more than two plus and bicarbonate level more less than 15 and the venous pH less than 7.3. Pathophysiology of DK, I'm just touching because of lack of uh, the insulin, basically the insulin deficiency leading to an increased gluco gluconeogenesis and decreased uptake glucose by cell, which all lead into a hyperglycemia and lead into a osmotic diuresis and dehydration. In addition, patient develop lipolysis and 
ultimately patient develop acetoacetic acid and the beta hydroxybutyric acid these are acidic environment causing the metabolic acidosis clinical feature of dk they usually present with typical symptoms like polyuria polydipsia weakness nausea and vomiting and they might develop vomiting and maybe coffee ground hemostasis in addition to that patient will develop abdominal pain therefore please if your patient comes with the nausea vomiting with abdominal pain not only think about acute abdomen please think about the dka as well please physical examination patient shows dehydration like dry mucous membrane tachycardia and hypotension altered mental status and patient might develop cushmal respiration as well as the acidotic breath the features of severe dk like not like pediatric uh, population the adult usually dk is defined as a dk but not the severity but these are the feature of severe dk for example if patient is having a bicarbonate level below 5 mm per liter and patient is having a ketone body of more than 6 with venous ph less than 7 less than 7 and the patient is having a significant hypokalemia that is less than 3.5 and patient is obtunded less than gcs of 12 and patient is having a uh, oxygen saturation less than 92 with systolic blood pressure less than 90 or patient who is having a tachy tachycardia or bradycardia with significant anion gap these are the features you might think about the patient who is having a dk yes this is the severe dk in severe dk patient need to be managed in the specially itu setting in addition pregnancy elderly and people age 18 to 25 this also need to be managed in the icu setting because their fluid calculation their physiology is quite different so therefore if patient who is pregnant elderly or patient who is 18 to 25 age you need to manage the patient in the intensive care unit what are the main causes of dk mortality in adult mainly severe hypokalemia is the main cause of death mortality in patient who is having a dk in adult other causes are ards and patient might deteriorate his precipitating condition for example acute myocardial infarction he might have a sepsis and pneumonia which deteriorate and patient might die in addition to the dk because of etiology of dk few word about euglycemic dk the concept for euglycemic dk now more prominent because of some most of the people basically in the europe or other world they are on sglt2 inhibitors but in sri lanka also we have quite number of patient who is on sglt2 inhibitors like empagliflozin uh, they might come with the euglycemic dk patient glucose level is normal or low in addition patient some the patient who is having a diabetic they are more knowledgeable about their condition and they are Uh, the sugar level they can manage and they are partial treatment of dk before their admission therefore people who are taking sglt2 inhibitor or partial treatment of dk before admission can give rise to e glycemic dk this management same as the dk of management of other patient who is having a dk but since they have eu glycemia normal glycemic they need to start straight away need to start 10% glucose 125 ml per minute ml per hour in addition to normal saline infusion if patient is having a blood sugar level less than 14 ml per liter and in, in in addition to that patient need to start same insulin dose that is 0.1 unit per kg per hour and once if patients fall fall in despite if patients glucose level is reduced despite of 10% glucose we need to reduce insulin dose 
to 0 0.05 to avoid hypoglycemia. These are the few words about euglycemia because as I mentioned, quite number of patient who is having a diabetes presented with the SGLT2 in uh, having a uh, taking SGLT2 and they come with the euglycemic BK. Therefore, we need to think about patient as a overall, if patient is critically ill, if patient is having a symptoms of DK, by checking sugar, don't make reassure yourself or don't make patient uh, prone to uh, get more and more uh, DK. By checking the sugar, they may be normal, but think about the patient as a overall. The patient is having the symptoms of DK, positive ketone bodies, increase uh, reduced pH on the bicarbonate, uh, normal glucose level might not matter of your management of DK. Monitoring of DK, uh, you need to check blood sugar and the ketone levels hourly. In addition to that, you need to check serum potassium level in one hour, two hour, and uh, again two hourly interval until patients need patient stabilize. And the bicarbonate level should be measured every two hourly until for six hours. In addition to that, urine output need to be checked. You have a EM of urine output is 0 0.5 milliliter per kilogram per hour. And if patient is having a reduced urine output or if patient is having a re, uh, impaired cardiovascular status and you need to think about catheterization, Otherwise, if patient is otherwise been well, we don't want to get the catheterized. Uh, but if patient shows poor urine output or patient does show any cardiovascular impairment or multiple comorbidities, yes, there is a place for catheterization. And in addition to that, you need to check three lead continuous ECG, as I mentioned, because patient might develop hypokalemia. Complication of DK, as I mentioned before, hypoglycemia, hypokalemia, cerebral edema, and ARDS. But patient who is but patient who is elderly DK, we don't usually get a cerebral edema. This is basically in the pediatric population, they will develop cerebral edema, but it is less severe in the patient who is having an adult DK. But ARDS, yes, ARDS patient might develop ARDS because of overseas fluid administration and corre uh, rapid correction. Key point in the management of DK, DK is a complex disorder of metabolic state characterized by hyperglycemia, acidosis and ketonemia. Ketone body monitoring is recommended, uh, blood ketone monitoring is recommended rather than the urine and ketone bodies. Fixed day rate of insulin is recommended of rate of 0 0.1 unit per kg per hour. And if patient's blood sugar less than 14 millimoles per liter, you need to add 10% dextrose alongside the normal saline. Wiener blood gas monitoring is acceptable. We don't want this arterial blood unless patient is having a severe hypoxemia. Potassium level should be closely monitored and the level and the level should be supplemented accordingly. Okay, we go, uh, can discuss the third case. This is 76 year old lady bought the bought in and referred with the confusion by your GP. She arrived with a family member and on arrival she was found to have a drowsy but she is arousable she is having a gcs of 14 she has been treated for uti in the last week and she has a background history of ischemic heart disease hypertension and the diabetes his initial observation show heart rate of 110 respiratory rate of 18 temperature of 37.8 blood pressure of 132 by 96 saturation was normal but patient show appears a dehydrated done the venous blood gas it shows ph of 7.36 is not acidotic or alkalotic 
carbon dioxide yes normal range she's light to raised uh, and he show she shows sodium of 152 bicarbonate of 20 and glucose is significantly raised 48 millimoles per liter ketone level is less than one lactate is 1.12 in this patient on arrival to the research vbg performed this is the vbg and we have calculated the serum osmolarity that is two sodium plus glucose and urea that is 361 millimoles that is higher than normal osmolality therefore in this patient is having a hyper smaller hyperglycemic state because patient is having a significant hyperglycemia and osmolality is 361 that is very significant and patient does not show any acidosis or patient does not show any other electrolyte imbalance significant electrolyte imbalance except sodium level is a bit high there's no clear-cut definition as such in dka to diagnose hhs but there are some clinical manifestation we can identify as a DK patient who is having a DK. These are hypovolemia, marked hyperglycemia that is more than 30 millimoles per liter without significant ketonemia or ketonuria. In the absence of or mild acidemia, the pH is more than 7.3 of bicarbonate is more than 15 millimoles per liter. And patients osmolality usually 320 millimoles or more. These are this HHA is very important because it has a significant mortality rate than DKA and is mainly happening in old elderly people who is having a DKA. Infection is the most common precipitating illness for uh, for HHS and few word about the pathophysiology. Patient who is having HHS have insulin resistance. Therefore, they have a counter regulatory hormones like a growth hormone, uh, steroid, corticosteroid. These causes hyperglycemia. But patient is having a sufficient insulin to inhibit lipogenos lipogenesis or ketogenesis. Therefore, patient won't develop ketoacidosis. Usual clinical presentations are nausea, vomiting, thirsty. Patient will develop weakness, lethargy, muscle cramps. Patient is having a drowsiness, delirium, and seizures. In addition to that, patient will develop neurological manifestation, and patient is having some features of underlying disease. For example, patient might show fever. Precipitating factors for patient uh, to get HHS are infection, stroke, myocardial infarction, intracranial hemorrhage, pulmonary embolism, pancreatitis, in addition to alcohol and the medication. Medication mainly the steroid, diuretics, antipsychotic medication, and the beta blockers. If patient who is on these medication, or if patient does show in signs of infection or any other these precipitant, you might think about the HHS in background of hyperglycemia and the hyperosmolality. Management of HHS is similar to DK, but since patient is usually patient who is coming with HHS are elderly and he, they have most of the time have a comorbidities like renal failure, liver, heart failure. Therefore, giving fluid is very cautious but you need to correct fluid and dehydration because they have a significant dehydration even than DKA. They have a significant body fluid deficit of eight to 10 liters. And if patient, uh, if patient who is coming with the HHS, we need to start 0 0.9 saline, that is normal saline, one liter over one hour, unless patient is shocked. If patient is shocked, we can give fluid boluses, but if patient does not show any signs of shock, you can treat patients as a DK regime, but we need to definitely think about the patient's cardiac function and other baseline cardiovascular status. Uh, 
and patient should be have a low threshold for central venous pressure monitoring to guide fluid resuscitation. Goal of treatment for DKA reduce serum glucose. It should be, but it should not more than 5 millimoles per liter per hour. And the serum reduction in serum osmolality by 3 to 8 millimoles per kilogram per hour. And the serum sodium loss should be less than 10 millimoles per liter, 10 millimoles per 24 hours because. If we drop more than that, patient will develop pantine myelinolysis. Reduce serum glucose. This can be achieved by intravenous fluid alone. Or if patient does not show an improvement after you correcting dehydration, you can start with low dose of fixed insulin infusion. That is half dose of uh, DKA, that is 0 0.05 unit per kilogram per hour. And our target is reduce blood sugar by 5 millimoles per liter per hour. Uh, the, the final target of blood sugar is to maintain 10 to 15 millimoles. But if patient still show, patient showing significant ketonemia or ketonuria, you can still start insulin uh, while you are resuscitating patient with intravenous fluid. Serum sodium, you need to expect that you, you need to expect serum sodium to fall, but less than 10 millimoles per lead, 10 millimoles per 24 hour, as I mentioned uh, before, because if you drop more than that, patient will develop osmotic myelinolysis, basically the pontine myelinolysis. Therefore, please make sure you are not dropping serum sodium level more than 10. The target is less than. 10 millimoles per over 24 hours. Increase in serum sodium, you can observe transiently at the first phase of DK, but it will gradually uh, drop to normal range. If, when you are treating patient to, uh, with intravenous fluid, basically correcting hydration will reduce, gradually reduce to your serum sodium level. 0 0.5 saline, that is half saline, should only be used if serum osmolality fails to fall after you correct in patient's volume status and with specialist advice. Therefore, if you are if, if still patient is having a hypernatremic state, still you can start 0 0.9 saline, not going for a half normal saline, that is 0 0.45 saline. Target of uh, other key strategies of management of HHS, you need to replace potassium as in the DKA and need to identify patient precipitating factor. Most of the time it is infection, but you need to think about other precipitating event as well. And especially we need to give thromboprophylaxis treatment because patient who is having a dehydration and hyperosmolality, especially they lead to a DVT and or pulmonary embolism. Therefore, please make sure you are treating patient who is having a DKA or HHS to give prophylaxis dose of DVT treatment. Complication of HHS, they also develop hypoglycemia and there is a high chance of patient to develop hypokalemia and as well as they might lead to a cerebral edema. This is more common than patient who is having a DK because rapid correction of hypernatremia can lead to a cerebral edema. In addition, you need to think about the DVT as well. Learning points pitfall of uh, uh, HHS. HHS has a highest mortality of uh, hyperglycemic status and need to calculate osmolality. Uh, osmolality uh, in patient who is when your patient managing uh, on, and the diagnosis of patient with HHS and the initial treatment is 0 0.9 saline to replace uh, a loss basically the at least 8 liter of body loss water loss and the rapid correction of serum osmolality sodium and the glucose level should be avoided 
Okay, this is the fourth and the last case in my presentation. Uh, we have a 32 year old type 1 diabetic female at a gestation, gestation of 30 weeks in her first pregnancy, coming with feeling of generally unwell. She has taken treatment for UTI, which is given by GP, which was treated with amoxicillin. But her symptoms, urinary symptoms, has improved, but she developed feeling of lethargy and unwell and fever plus vomiting over the last 24 hours. She was, she was showing a uterus consisting of third trimester pregnancy, but she shows significant signs of dehydration. There's no other signs of infection. Doppler examination of the fetus show fetal beat of 185. Her initial observations are pulse rate of 28, saturation of 94 on air, and heart rate of 130, blood pressure of 100 by 60 with temperature of 37.8. Since this is most likely a patient who is having a diabetic ketoacidosis, in addition to the initial management, we need to get obstetric and the ITU team on the board to manage patient as a multidisciplinary. Patient was given oxygen intravenous access and started 0.9 saline. And patients was, uh, patient urine was very positive for ketone bodies. And her blood gas show pH of 7.25 with bicarbonate of 15 and base excess of minus 7.8. And these fulfill the criteria of DK. DK management of DK not much differ from patient who is a non-pregnant status, but patient who is having a patient who is in a pregnancy, especially in the second and the third trimester, they will usually develop DK than the first trimester. And DK can occur in relatively low or even normal sugar level in patient with pregnancy. Therefore, please make sure patient has an overall, not uh, if patient is having a normal blood sugar, don't uh, exclude DK in pregnancy. Ketone in urine dipstick are diagnostic, not diagnostic. Ketone in urine dipstick are not diagnostic of DK in pregnancy. This should be not diagnostic of DK in pregnancy. Sorry for that uh, wording. And good history and the high glucose and the ketone in urine with metabolic acidosis will give the diagnosis. And the DK has a, a DK in pregnancy has a significant risk of fetal mortality up to 35%. Therefore, if patient is having a DK in pregnancy, it's a very serious. You need to manage patient in the ITU environment. Fluid replacement, fluid resuscitation regime is differ little from non-pregnant DK. Basically, you need to think about the patient as an overall and the fluid status and central venous line with ITU care is mandatory for patient who is having a DK in pregnancy. Cerebral edema is rare complication in uh, DK in pregnancy as well, like in same as adult DK. Uh, emergency cesarean section, no, there's no any place for emergency cesarean section in patient who is DK in pregnancy, even patient in the third trimester, because it will aggravate, it will worsen the condition, basically for mother and fetus. Therefore, it is not encouraging uh, to have a, either surgery or any other cesarean section for a patient who is in a DK, uh, because it can worsen the DK and it can worsen the metabolic status of the patient. A learning point in the DK in pregnancy, uh, it is an emergency and it is important and treatable cause of maternal and the fetal death. DK can occur faster in pregnant female, relative or, or, and relatively no, low or even normal blood sugar level. Therefore, consider patient as an overall. Early recognition of DK in pregnancy and importance of maternal resuscitation 
will reduce both maternal and the fetal mortality. And the high dependency, as I mentioned, high dependency, high dependency care, ITO care, and the involvement of senior members of the obstetric medical and the other team and the multidisciplinary approach is main stay of management of patient who is having a pregnancy decay. Yeah, that is all I want to talk, but if you have any problem uh, or any question, this is time for you to ask any questions. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for your very informative lecture. And I want to say it was very clear uh, uh, as uh, the way you presented as a case-based discussion. And uh, there are a few questions in the chat box. Uh, may I ask you, sir? Yeah, please. Yeah. So if patient can take, uh, I think uh, the, the first questions are regarding yeah. the case one. Yeah. Uh, if patient can take orally, what about giving 50% dextrose IV as oral? Yeah, that is okay. Because if patient is having, uh, if patient able to take orally, you can give oral that 50% dextrose, uh, 50 ml of dextrose because it's contained 25 gram of dextrose. Therefore, it is okay to give 50% dextrose in 50% uh, 50 ml of dextrose orally if patient able to take orally. So giving oral glucose in hypoglycemia, can't it produce a rebound hypoglycemia? Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, because patient who is having a uh, patient is able, to, if patient is able to take orally, 50% uh, dextrose, usually it absorb through the gut and it metabolize in the liver. Therefore, it won't usually produce rebound hypoglycemia yeah, as in intravenous because intravenous you can get massive load of massive load of dextrose or glucose. It stimulate insulin synthesis as well as it uh, prevent uh, gluconeogenesis and glycogen mobilization. Therefore, it is usually not happen with oral glucose. If patient is taking 50%, 50 ml of dextrose orally, there won't be any significant problem of rebound hypoglycemia. If patient has alcoholic yeah. uh, with severe hypoglycemia, do we need to give thiamine initially or straight away give dextrose and thiamine later? No, first line is the thiamine first. As I mentioned before, one to two milligram of uh, milligram per kg. That is usually we are giving 100 milligram of thiamine before you give in the uh, dextrose or you can combine both. You can give combine com as a combination, but you need to give at least even before or at the time of you giving the dextrose infusion. Uh, why we should not give glucose if we suspect vernicase? Uh, it versus the when case, basically uh, vernicase encopathy happened in the patient who is having a thiamine deficiency in addition to the hypoglycemia. But if you are not given thiamine before you give in the glucose, it might precipitate basically vernicase encopathy. That is why you need to give thiamine beforehand we give in the uh, dextrose or glucose. Why glucagon is not given in sulfonylurea overdose? Yeah, as I mentioned, uh, the it has uh, the in sulfonylurea uh, patient who is uh, in a sulfonylurea or uh, taking a sulfonylurea, there is a reduced glycogen uh, in the body. Therefore, glucagon there is a no place for glucagon to act. Therefore, in patient who is sulfonylurea taking sulfonylurea or patient has the uh, overdose of sulfonylurea, we can't give glucagon because there's a reserves are less. There's nothing to mobilize to make glucose. Therefore, reserves are less in this patient. Therefore, we can't glu give glucagon in patient who is having a sulfonylurea or like in uh, prolonged starved patient. Is DKA management is different in CKD patients? Uh, DK management is you need to adjust, uh, not to different, but the main like main strategies are same. Main strategies are same. Like you need to give intravenous fluid, you need to give insulin, you need to give correct potassium. But for a patient who is having a CKD, 
there is a significant risk of hyperkalemia there is a significant risk of fluid overload therefore you need to if patient who is having a dk uh, ckd who is developing dk you need to pay, manage patient in the itu care as well as patient need to have a early central venous line to monitor the patient's fluid status as well as we, to have a cardiac monitoring throughout the management because patient might go into the hyperkalemic status but usually once you given the insulin a patient won't get much hyperkalemia but patient can get hypokalemia therefore yes patient who is having a dk uh, ckd in the, uh, in the case of uh, dk management patient need to be first patient need to be managed in the itu setting second patient fluid status need to be carefully managed carefully addressed in a company that is basically multidisciplinary with the nephrologist as well as the itu team can give potassium chloride in saline without checking potassium level no uh, basically uh, uh, the first line in the dk management is intravenous fluid second also intravenous fluid third also intravenous fluid but we can support it insulin potassium and other electrolytes but we can't straight away start potassium chloride in a patient with dk first thing you need to think about the patient's volume status and whether the patient is passing adequate urine that is 0.5 milliliter per kilogram per hour if those are uh, fulfilled then you can start potassium but without that you can't start potassium so what's the uh, glucose dose in hypoglycemic cardiac arrest yeah uh, if patient uh, if patient is uh, uh, having a uh, what is the question the glucose dose in glucose hypoglycemic dose in yeah, hypoglycemic yeah. Uh, glucose dose in hypoglycemic is same same as uh, management of the hypoglyce hypoglycemia in other settings because uh, there's no any significant deviation for example we are giving the 10% dextrose until up to 200 ml uh, uh, 200 ml boluses in hypo uh, hypoglycemic status in cardiac arrest it is same same dose we are practicing no need to give 50% dextrose in cardiac arrest who patient is having a hypoglycemia you can only give uh, 10% dextrose 200 ml this is updated erc als guideline how frequently should we repeat vbg uh, uh, vbg as i mentioned in the uh, lecture bbg we need to think about uh, the uh, one thing is whether like if you are taking bbg for ph yes hourly if you are taking bbg to assess potassium it is also different like if patient is having a, uh, if you want to check potassium level first you need to check in one hour then two hour then hourly two hourly basis therefore it's differ what you want to do like if you want to check ph yes you can do with hourly basis in first uh, two hours and then after that if patient is stable you can do two hourly basis and if you want to do potassium if you want to check potassium level from ebg then you can do one hour after then two hour and then two hourly basis these are like i mean like this is basically depend on your requirement uh, of doing a vbg rather than uh, 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 rather than other other parameters like if you want to do potassium there's these are the guideline if you want to check uh, sugar uh, from bbg that is also uh, our basis but you can check sugar in the uh, rbs monitor but uh, this is basically depend on the what you want to check uh, what is the equivalent of urine ketone with serum ketone of 0.6 millimole per liter uh there's uh, there's no that kind of a uh, equation or conversion because in serum what we are looking for uh, beta hydroxy butyric acid in urine we are mainly looking for aceto acetone or aceto acetic acid acetic aceto acetone or acetone therefore there's no conversion from one component to the other component therefore if patient is having if we are checking urine for ketone body we are checking aceto acetone if you are checking 
blood for ketone bodies basically we are checking beta hydroxybutyrate therefore we can't uh, mutually uh, convert these two uh, kind of a chemical uh, uh, we can't convert the, these two chemical two kind of a chemical from each other therefore uh, uh, i can't give an answer for that but uh, we are measuring two different level of chemical in the urine and the blood in bka can we manage with intramuscular insulin uh, that is a good question but usually we are not encouraging any uh, patient who is critically ill to manage any intramuscular uh, injection because uh, patient is having a very irrational absorption of insulin and very irrational uh, circulation in intramuscular setting therefore we are not encouraging patient to uh, treat with intramuscular insulin in patient who is having a dk or hhs and uh, sometimes some uh, some centers or some people are encouraging to have a subcutaneous insulin but it's also a little bit i mean like doubt because it's many uh, the absorption is irrational therefore it's better to go ahead with the intravenous insulin injection in a critically ill patient when dk is dka is settled how much insulin we need to give uh, subcutaneously before omit infusion how to calculate it yeah as i mentioned in the lecture uh, one thing is you need to continue insulin infusion that is ongoing insulin infusion at least 30 minutes or one hour after you start in subcutaneous insulin subcutaneous insulin dose depend on the weight of the patient for example if your patient is 60 kg that 0.5 into 60 that is 30 unit of insulin per day this 30 unit of insulin you can give to uh, a two component of insulin basically the rapid acting insulin and the long acting insulin rapid acting insulin you can give two third and long acting insulin of one third for example now our, our patient is 60 kg total daily requirement is 30 unit of insulin 20 unit you can give as a rapid and uh, 10 unit you can give as a long acting usually long acting give in the evening or night the rapid acting insulin you can divide into three meals that is 20 20 divided by three uh, we can take it's roughly uh, 6.5 and uh, uh, in that six, suppose you take the six, six in the morning, six in the lunch, and the six in the uh, evening or night meal. That is how you can calculate and you can divide the morning insulin, uh, uh, lunch insulin, and the night insulin, as well as the rapid acting and the long acting insulin. How we can manage hypokalemia in aneuric patient with BKA? Hypokalemia, hi, hyper. Hypokalemia. Hypo, hypokalemia in patient with uh, DK, patient who is having a hypokalemia in patient with DK, as I mentioned, a patient is having a in aneuric patient. Oh, sorry, aneuric patient. In aneuric patient, uh, basically you need to think about whether the patient is getting at least some urine output or whether the patient fluid status is okay. If patient is fluid status is okay. Uh, we, I mean, like uh, for an aneuric patient, we can definitely give uh, potassium chloride solution. But you need to correct patient's volume status. We need to rehydrate patient. Once you get rehydrated, patient automatically will uh, uh, produce urine, unless patient is having a significant uh, renal impairment. If patient is having a re significant renal impairment, as I mentioned before, patient definitely in the ITU setting, and patient need to be have a. Uh, uh, continuous renal replacement therapy patient need to be have on re CRRT uh, machine as well as uh, if patient need to be high and patient need to be hydrated hydrated accordingly. Once you get hydration, you can start KCL, but you need to have some urine output or if patient is on CRRT, yes, you can start with uh, KCL in patient in this kind of a patient. But not per se aneuric patient, we can't give KCL in ward setting or ITU set, uh, emergency department setting, but patient need to be in ITU. 
uh, what's the place for oral 50% dextrose in a conscious patient with moderate hypoglycemia? Uh, yeah, um, that is, uh, we can give moderate hypoglycemia. As I mentioned, it is around uh, 2.2 to 3.9. You can give 50% uh, um, uh, dextrose, 50% dextrose, 50 ml orally for a moderate hypoglycemia. That is okay because it has a 25 gram of glucose. In DKA, in a non-patient with diabetes mellitus who was on insulin, can we start his usual dose of subcutaneous insulin at the same time of intravenous insulin? Yeah, yeah uh, he can start it with on the uh, same dose of ins intravenous insulin. For example, as I mentioned before in the, my case scenario, a patient who is non-patient with diabetic on coming with the treat, uh, coming with the DKA, and he is anyway he had a he was on insulin treatment beforehand. In that patient, we can uh, go ahead. Uh, we can straight away go ahead with this that baseline insulin treatment, but uh, uh, not the rapid acting insulin. You can start to, when you are when the patient is on insulin uh, when the patient on, on continuous insulin infusion, but you can start with long acting insulin. Uh, but if you want to start with uh, uh, soluble insulin, that is rapid acting insulin, we can give insulin beforehand, 30, uh, the sub, uh, subcutaneously beforehand, you stop treatment, uh, basically one hour before, uh, stop your continuous insulin infusion. Can HHS occur in type 1 diabetes mellitus also? Uh, yes, we can. Uh, the, they can also develop uh, uh, HHS, but it is a bit rare. But most of the time, patient who is having a type 2 diabetes will develop the HHS uh, rather than the type 1. What is the role of hypomagnesium in persistent DKA? Uh, magnesium, you mean uh, uh, magnesium? Potent, uh, magnesium. Potent, magne magnesium, level? magnesium level okay magnesium level yes because if patient is having a persistent hypokalemia there's a place for giving the magnesium sulfate basically two gram uh, but uh, uh, we need to check whether the patient is taking uh, having a uh, patient is treating with adequate potassium but uh, in addition to that if patient is having a significant magnesium low magnesium level, definitely we need to correct that one. Otherwise, patient will develop arrhythmia. Can 25% dextrose given in, as intravenous? Uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, the only thing is the uh, it, uh, one thing, it, it also can have an effect on rebound hyperglycemia. It also has a, a significant osmolality because 10% uh, uh, dextrose, 10% glucose has an osmolality of 500. And 50% dextrose has an osmolality of 2,500. And 25% uh, of dextrose, nearly 1,000 to 1,200. Usually, we can give uh, uh, the, uh, the, any solution through the peripheral line if it is osmolality less than 900. That is our target. Therefore, we can definitely give 10% dextrose. But we can't give 25% dextrose. One thing is it is hyposmolated solution. Other one is it has significant uh, 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 the rebound hypoglycemic rebound hypoglycemic effect. Therefore, we encourage you to give 10% dextrose rather than 25 or 50% dextrose. There's a practical problem, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. Since there are little facilities in division, uh, divisional hospitals, yeah. how to manage these conditions? Because no way to check potassium levels, no VBG VB, or ABG. Yeah, yeah. yeah it is, uh, I can really understand because uh, uh, that is good question. Like in the resource poor setting, how to manage patient with uh, DKA or uh, HHS or hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia, I think, uh, yes. You can clinically think whether the patient is having the symptoms of hypoglycemia. In that case, you can treat. Even though patient is having a normal sugar, you don't want to kill. You, you, you are not going to kill the patient by giving a sort of dextrose. Therefore, if patient, if you are thinking that patient is having a hypoglycemia, especially a patient who is having a diabetic, coming with symptoms of hypoglycemia, you can try with 10% uh, dextrose, 50 ml bolus, and then check whether the patient is getting improved. You don't want to check uh, sugar level. Uh, uh, before and after, but you can 
clinically think about whether the patient is having a hypoglycemia, clinically hypoglycemia. In that case, you can, yes, you can treat hypoglycemia by giving 10% dextrose. Second one, patient who is having a DK, there is a problem, uh, problem of diagnosing. The only thing is patient, you can diagnose the DK. One thing is you need to have a sugar level. Second one is you need to have pH or bicarbonate level. Other one is you need to have a ketone body. But I mean, like if you have like, if you at least have a urine dipstick in your uh, hospital, there is a that uh, 12 dip stick, 12 reading dipstick test. It has a ketone body in one that cal calorimetric. Uh, the, yeah, like you can check whether the patient is having a ketone body by checking that dip, uh, by doing that dipstick test. And clinically, you can think whether the since patient is uh, like patient who is coming with typical features of polyuria, polydipsia, and critically ill patient coming with abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, you can clinically think this whether this patient is having a DK. In that case, you can support it urine ketone body, and you can make a probable diagnosis. You don't want to make a complete diagnosis of DK or stages of DK, but you can make a probable working diagnosis. In that case, you can start intravenous fluid because patient is almost dehydrated and you can start with intravenous, uh, intravenous fluid by giving normal saline. And even uh, like if you don't have a sugar, we, uh, we I'm not recommending to give insulin because you might get the hypoglycemia, but you can definitely start inter intravenous fluid by starting intravenous fluid for both DK and HHS as a significant reduction in mortality because the main aim of treatment in both is hydration. Therefore, if you don't have a facility to check even B uh, BM, sugar level, still you can start uh, uh, intravenous fluid by giving hydration, adequate hydration of normal saline. But if you have a facility to do check the BM, the sugar level, then you can with symptoms with high sugar by checking BM and the urine ketone body, you can think about this is most likely DK. In that case, you can start with insulin, as I mentioned, the, that uh, fixed dose insulin regime. Therefore, in practical setting, if you don't have anything, still you can start intravenous, uh, intravenous fluid. Second, if you have a facility to check ketone body, or if you have a facility to check blood sugar, yes, then can, you can have a probable diagnosis. In that case, even you can start insulin after you hydrate in the patient. And after that, you can uh, contact the nearest facility resource, as, uh, uh, resource, I mean like resource good setting, and then you can send the patient, you can transfer the patient. But first line management is for both, uh, DK and HHS is the uh, good hydration. Therefore, please make sure you start at least some fluid before you send in the patient if you don't have any facility. But you can start definitely giving intravenous insulin, fixed dose of intravenous insulin in patient if you have facility to check uh, sugar level and the urine ketone body. No need to go for a pH level. We can check pH later once you get the facilities. Even we don't have a facility to do pH nowadays in our uh, uh, big centers. So in DKA, should uh, insulin always be given by uh, given as infusion, or is there a place for a subcutaneous or IV bolus infusion? Uh, there's no place of uh, IV bolus infusion, but there are some people are recommending to give subcutaneous insulin, as I mentioned before. Uh, subcutaneous insulin has irrational absorption. That is the only thing. Uh, definitely not the IV boluses of insulin, but uh, sometimes you might, uh, some people are, some uh, 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 persons are uh, recommending to give the subcutaneous, but uh, in emergency setting, I'm recommending to give intravenous insulin rather than the subcutaneous insulin. So can you kindly explain uh, the way of Preparing 10% dextrose. Yeah, 10% dextrose, I have given the uh, one slide, but I'll, I'll repeat it. 10% uh, dextrose, if you don't have 10% dextrose, but thing, one thing you can give is 10 ml of 5% dextrose, you can add to 100 ml of 
five percent exposure. Sorry, I will repeat it. 50, uh, five, uh, 10 ml of 50% dextrose. 10, 10 ml of 50% dextrose, you can add to 100 ml of 5% dextrose. Then you can get 110 ml of 10% dextrose. Or simply, what you can do is take a 500 ml of 5% dextrose back and then take off 50 ml from that 5%, 500 ml of uh, dextrose then add 50 ml of 50 percent dextrose then you will get 500 ml of 9.5 percent dextrose not the exactly 10 percent but 9.5 it is same and almost 10 therefore you can make 10 percent dextrose by doing taking off 50 ml of 5 percent dextrose from a 500 bag and add in 50 ml 50 percent dextrose so in dka once cbs levels falls below 14 milligram per deciliter are we changing normal saline to 10 percent dextrose so we add 10 percent dextrose along with normal saline yeah it is uh, it should be corrected to 14 millimoles not milligrams okay. per deciliter but if patient coming down uh, from uh, to 14 millimoles per liter you can because uh, uh, the aim is to run insulin infusion because we need to run in insulin infusion to take off the ketone in the body not to make the uh, glycemic monitor glycemic control but to take off the ketone from the body therefore if patient is getting a uh, the, the the sugar level less than 14 millimoles we need to start additional glucose that is 10 percent glucose we are adding in addition to the ongoing normal saline drip usually we start in 10 percent dextrose 125 ml per hour in addition to ongoing normal saline dose therefore one line you have in a normal saline other line second line you have 10 percent dextrose in addition you are giving insulin infusion in that case insulin uh, because there is a risk of hyperglycemia and uh, that is why we need to give 10 percent dextrose in that case you can half the ongoing insulin infusion that is you is still since you are running with 0 0.1 unit you can make it half 0 0.05 unit per kilogram per unit per kilogram per hour uh, therefore the patient is getting a uh, uh, sugar level less than 14 thing what few things you want to do one thing is you need to start in 10% uh, dextrose 125 ml per hour 10% dextrose in addition to you can half the insulin uh, infusion rate by 0 0.05 uh, any place for cvp line insertion other than pregnancy and ckd in dka or hsh yeah yeah, if patient is having a, like a, a renal a renal failure, as we mentioned, renal failure, pregnancy, in addition to the cardiac failure, the uh, uh, cardiac failure, and if patient is having a significant mort morbidity, like if patient is having a severe obesity and we don't want to get the uh, adequate blood pressure monitoring, and therefore uh, we need to have a think about the patient in an individual basis, and in the like in a refractory shock we can start, uh, we can give, uh, we can insert the central venous pressure line, CVP line, in addition to the pregnancy and the uh, CKD. There are like heart failure, uh, uh, multiple comorbidities, refractory shock. These are other causes, other uh, indication you to have a CVP line in addition to that previously mentioned indications. Uh, this is regarding a uh, diagnosis, what's uh uh, when diagnosis DKA in pregnancy, uh, the criteria I think she asked uh, is it high ketones plus high glucose or high glucose alone without ketones plus DKA symptoms? Yeah, usually uh, it's like uh, it is not hard and fast in uh, the diagnosis of DKA in pregnancy because there are hard and fast criteria, that is, three criteria. For a patient who is non-pregnant, a pregnant patient problem is they have 
ketone urea usually have a ketone urea in their urine therefore problem is if you are checking ketone body in a non uh, in a pregnant patient even though they don't have a hyperglycemia they will have a ketone because the pregnant patient might have vomiting prolonged fasting their metabolic status they usually produce ketone in uh, they will have a ketone in their urine therefore checking ketone in urine is a bit uh, i mean like uh, confusing therefore it is recommended to check ketone body in blood especially in pregnancy patient to make that confusion set therefore if patient is having a hyperglycemia and uh, uh, venous blood gas shown the high uh, the low ph or low bicarbonate it is better you check ketone body in serum unfortunately we don't have but in the practical mm -hmm. setting yes but uh, if you have only facility to check ketone body in urine it need to be at least to more than 2 plus to make it significant okay uh, the questions in the chat box are over uh, so uh, the link for applying e certificate uh, for your participation uh, has been sent to the chat box also we uh, highly appreciate your feedbacks for developing future webinars also uh, i thank uh, sri cpd team for organizing today's cpd also for all participants for joining with us today and i thank you very much sir dr bandara ekanayaka a consultant uh, in emergency medicine for allocating his precious time on behalf of junior doctors today with an excellent lecture. Thank, Thank you, you very much.